The dispute over the case for war intensifies at the same time as a top secret spy program comes under challenge from within the United States government. In the wake of 9-11, Cheney had wanted to expand electronic surveillance to hunt terrorists inside the United States. Cheney and his lawyer, David Eddington, had helped design a new program that would keep tabs on billions of phone calls and emails. But existing law said that a special court had to issue a warrant for each individual the government wanted to monitor. Big problem was it didn't allow us to get a fast enough turnaround on threats to be able to effectively intercept the communications we needed to guard against a further prospective attack. The question then arose, should we go to Congress and ask them to adjust the law? Dick Cheney was a strong proponent of not going to Congress. Cheney knew that the Justice Department had the power to write a secret memo, saying that the administration didn't need any warrants for the new widespread spying. Justice had then issued the memo. From time to time, there may be something so sensitive that you don't want to uh, raise the specter, the possibility that uh, it might be leaked. And there are some things that need secrecy. The administration now undertook a massive program of warrantless surveillance on Americans. Addington had taken charge of the paperwork. The president had to sign an authorization every 30 or 45 days, thereabouts, to, to keep it going. The program would have automatically shut down any time that approval wasn't granted. It worked. It was a good program. I think it saved a lot of lives and, and did a lot to allow us to uh, thwart uh, prospective attacks by al-Qaeda. At the end of 2003, two new people, important people, arrived at the Justice Department. One is Jack Goldsmith, who becomes the head of the Office of Legal Counsel. And then there's a new Deputy Attorney General, Jim Comey. Jack Goldsmith starts to look at this thing. The harder he looks at it, both the technical side and the legal side, uh, the more his head starts to hurt. Goldsmith and Comey are conservatives. They are Republicans. They just simply happen not to be uh, adherents to the notion that the president uh, need not obey federal law. The president signed up for it. Uh, lawyers signed up for it. Original package they had been uh, reviewed at the appropriate level in the Justice Department, and John Ashcroft and others had, had signed up to it. This debate begins between Justice and the Vice President's office primarily at the end of December 2003. It gets more and more intense in January and February and comes to a head in March. Attorney General John Ashcroft must sign off on the program for it to continue, but he'll only sign if Comey and Goldsmith tell him it's okay. The deadline to renew the program is drawing closer, but Cheney does not tell Bush of the growing resistance at the Justice Department. One week before the program is due to expire, Comey meets with Ashcroft. Comey says, boss, we work this through every way we can. We think this, this, and this are illegal. We don't think you should sign off on it. Ashcroft says, OK, go tell them to make those changes. If they don't make those changes, I'm not signing. Hours after his conversation with Comey, Ashcroft is stricken with acute pancreatitis. He is rushed to the hospital and hovers on the brink of death. He suddenly decided when he was sick that he was going to delegate all this authority to Comey, and Comey was then the acting attorney general. The next day, Goldsmith tells Addington that justice won't recertify the surveillance program. It will now expire in five days. Three days later, Cheney meets with Comey and Goldsmith. The chief of staff was there, uh, Vice President Cheney. I was there. Cheney says to Comey, how can you possibly reverse the department's course on something this critical to the security of the United States? Comey looks Cheney right in the eye and he says, just because you really want it doesn't mean it's legal. No lawyer who's looked really hard at this thing has said it's okay. David Addington pipes up and says, I did. Comey says, no good lawyer. I'd call it tension in the air, yeah. In early March, Bush is frequently away from Washington, campaigning for re-election. The day before the deadline, during a brief stop in the Capitol, 
Cheney finally tells him that the warrantless surveillance program is in danger. Bush is given the impression that Ashcroft's been signing all along, but now his deputy has uh, got the steering wheel for five minutes and he won't do it. He doesn't have any idea that there's been a three-month controversy over this or that uh, there are big substantive objections. That night, Comey and two dozen other top lawyers at Justice prepare to resign if the administration continues spying without warrants. It will be the largest resignation in the history of the United States government. It was Wednesday, March the 10th, 2004. And how do you remember that date so well? This was a uh, very memorable uh, period in my life, probably the most difficult time in my entire professional life. And that night was probably the most difficult night of my professional life. The next day, without telling Bush that mass resignations are on the way, Cheney advises the president to reauthorize the program without the approval of the Department of Justice. The president extended the warrantless surveillance program in the face of the new opinion of the Justice Department that it was illegal. The program was reauthorized without us, uh, without a signature from the Department of Justice attesting as to its legality. I prepared a letter of resignation intending to resign. I couldn't stay if the administration was going to engage in conduct that the Department of Justice had said had no legal basis. I simply couldn't stay. George Bush, he doesn't know what the stakes are. You had, for example, the chief of staff of uh, Attorney General Ashcroft saying uh, he's going to want to resign, too, as soon as he's healthy enough. You have the director of the FBI, Bob Mueller, saying, if justice tells me I can't participate in this, I'm not going to. And if you order me to, I also resign. So the president now has this unprecedented meltdown happening at the Department of Justice, and he does not know it. Nobody tells him. This is March of 2004. Elections coming in November. This would have been the end of Bush's presidency. He would have been a one-term president. So the next morning, so they have the morning briefing, a regular Friday briefing on the terrorist threat. Condi Rice he tells the president, something's on Jim Comey's mind. He's a good man. Maybe you ought to check. Bush takes him into his private dining room, and he says, What's all this I hear about you not signing? How can you possibly sort of this last minute, late in the game, suddenly tell us it's no good? Comey is floored. He says to the president, if your staff is telling you that, you are being very poorly served. Comey was planning on just resigning, but he feels now like the president doesn't understand what's happening. Bush tells Comey to change the surveillance program and make it legal. So what you've just had is in 24 hours, a little less than that, the President of the United States doing a complete 180. He had the day before signed an order that said, in your face, despite your objections, I'm authorizing this thing. And the next day he caves in and says, no mas, I will do it the way you say I'm allowed to do it. I will stop doing the things you say I can't do. That is unprecedented in American history. In the end, what ended up happening were revisions were made to the program and so forth. So we had to adjust and adapt, which we did. My personal view uh, was different in the sense that I basically would have let them resign because uh, I thought the program was perfectly legitimate and it was totally uh, necessary and it had been totally approved and signed up to 20 separate occasions by the Attorney General of the United States. So, you know. In his memoir, Bush writes, I never wanted to be blindsided like that again. 